Support from today's show comes from Incorporate. Incorporate's a site where, surprise, you can incorporate a business. Use the link in the show notes, thebiggamehunter.us forward slash incorporate. And they are a fairly priced firm. After all, if you're starting a business or you have a friend who's going to start a business or a member of your family that's starting a business, you got to do it the legal way. Incorporate will do it for you. And with that, we'll be back in just one moment. This is No BS Job Search Advice Radio, episode 2180. I'm Jeff Alpin, the Big Game Hunter, and welcome. I've got a great interview today with a former musician. I knew his band back in the day, and uh, he's going to talk about succeeding in jobs that don't exist yet. It's an interesting interview. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. And it opens up your mind to a lot of creativity. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you give the show an honest review wherever you listen to it. Every review that you give allows Apple, Spotify, Google Play, all the services to recommend the show. It does really help. And we'll be back in just one moment. Today's show is brought to you by Fiverr. Fiverr is a service where, frankly, you can outsource a lot of tasks to someone else and have them do it very inexpensively. If you've ever watched or observed the show notes, not the show notes, but the transcriptions for this show, what you'll see is work that's been done by someone I've hired on Fiverr. I've also had uh, editing for my books done on Fiverr. I've had a variety of different functions done there, and I've done it for years. It saves a lot of time. It's very inexpensive, and I'll just simply say, use the link in the show notes. It helps support the advertiser and lets them know that this show has meaning for you. And with that, we'll be back in just one moment. So my guest today is Christopher Bishop, but you can call him Chris, who's a workplace futurist who's had eight careers, sorry, eight careers <laughs> so far, including touring rock musician, jingle producer, website project manager, among others. He spent 15 years in corporate at IBM in a variety of roles, including business strategy consultant, communications executive, and driving <laughs> social media adoption much better, and the use of virtual <laughs> worlds for training events. He's also got a program that he'll talk about later on uh, that will help you experience, uh, shall we say, succeed at jobs that don't exist yet. Christopher or Chris, welcome. <laughs> Appreciate well, you having you having you on today. Well, thank you, Jeff. I'm delighted to be here, man. Looking forward to our conversation. Thanks for inviting me. It is my pleasure. And with that, let me just start by saying eight careers, eight eight careers <laughs> yeah is there a common theme that runs through some of these careers or through all of them well i'd say i mean at a meta level probably curiosity right so i'm a curious guy i'm always interested in kind of new stuff certainly new tech but looking to do things that you know i get bored easily maybe i'm looking to do things that are uh that are interesting that keep me sort of engaged the other thing i would say is themes that have run through these eight careers are could be summarized sort of in three data points or four, if you will. Chase the maelstrom, find the chaos, go for the mayhem. So by so, that, I mean- I'm seeing a theme there. <laughs> yeah, there's like a theme, right? So it's like, my, my advice is, you know, go where they don't know what it is yet. And the royal they being existing business models or organizations, right? Um, and that, that approach has served me well in the 45 years since I graduated from college with a degree in German lit of all things. But if I look for, look Big for market the for German lit majors. Oh yeah. Well, I used to translate the menus for the band when we were on the road in Germany, right? <laughs> That's kind of the real world application for that skill. Um, but it's like, find where they don't know what it is. And then you can contribute. You can help create whatever the new thing is. Um, and with any luck, be remunerated, right? Make a living. I mean, get get paid to do it. So, 
So in navigating from being a touring rock musician, by the way, there's no such thing as rock and roll anymore, to really? working at IBM, how the heck should you manage this? Yeah. Well, so um, I toured with this band right after college um, and did three albums with them and uh, opened for bands like the Eagles and ZZ Top and Fleetwood Mac. And then the band broke up, typical kind of, you know, standard deviation kind of curve. Who's this band? Hire this band. Where's this band? Um, when they broke up, we broke up. I moved to New York and became a studio musician, played with people like Robert Palmer and Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Ronnie Spector. And then I uh, came off a tour one time and said, how do I sleep in my own bed at night? Asked all my musician friends. And they said, jingles, man, you got to break into the session scene. So I was like, mm, okay, well, let me figure that out. So I tracked down anyone and everyone I knew in that business um, and called them. Uh, this is way before LinkedIn or email, obviously. This is like the early 80s. Uh, and said, you know, introduced myself and said, can you give me three names that I can call? And basically built my network and eventually broke into the session scene as a, first as a bass player and then as an arranger and then as a composer and finally as a producer. So the segue though is that in about 1985, music became data. So by that, I mean the technology had emerged that allowed you to sample and sequence, meaning capture instrument timbres digitally and store them on it, in this case, a Winchester hard drive, which is a big box like the size of a toaster oven that you know stored 512K, you had to slide it into this big rack. Um, but I became intrigued with tech and computers. I bought a Mac Plus and learned how to program it and uh, how to sequence on it. And MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface, um, how to stripe a track with Simpy so it could chase lock the picture, so you could lay in the sound effects at exactly the right moment. They would speak at when the film went by. Um, so that was sort of my introduction to technology. And the segue is um, I became intrigued with this wacky technology called the World Wide Web in the early 90s when I was working at the Shingle House and taught myself to be a web producer, hung out a shingle, worked uh, at a couple of seminal interactive agencies in New York, and then much to my surprise, got an opportunity to interview at IBM because they were building out their corporate internet programs at the time, it's like 1998. And they hired me like on the spot to join this big corporation. I'm like, well, what would I do at IBM? But the key is, again, this is a message for your listeners, right? I didn't get hired at IBM because I was cute or had a hip shirt or a stylish hairdo or whatever. I got hired because I had a skill that they needed at that point in time. And to be honest, there weren't a lot of people who knew how to produce websites in the late 90s. So they put together this team and we were sent out to the business to help drive standards, both from a design and technology perspective. I want to I want to interpret some things that you said for the audience okay. and because you gave not just one lesson, but a lot of them along the way in describing it. So let, let's see what I heard. Okay. okay. So you had an itch, you want to get off the road. And instead of trying to figure it out yourself, you ask some people what they thought you might be able to do. Yeah. They gave you an idea of something that was proximate to what you were already doing. Exactly. And that is, it was still music, but it wasn't touring music. It was the idea of getting into jingles, but there were going to be steps for getting into jingles. So you started talking to people and yeah. eventually you got your first entree into local music. And Obviously, not everyone returns your call, much the way, same way, folks, is not everyone is going to respond to your message on LinkedIn or respond to the email or text that you send them. Yeah. But you were determined and you persevered despite frustration until eventually you broke into something, maybe not where you ultimately wanted to get to, but it was steps along the way that moved you in that direction. Yeah. Until eventually I heard the magic words, Jingle House. <laughs> yeah. And there were a couple of steps before Jingle House that you did um, that kept getting you closer. So yeah. folks recognize you may not be able to do a direct leap from where you are now to where you want to get to. And you may need to take steps to move you in that direction. Were you still touring at all during that time? Um, I was still doing some gigs. Um, 
I actually had a residency in New York. I was playing four nights a week at an Irish bar on East 86th Street. And we used to play like down the East Coast in DC and Philly. And sometimes I'd get a call for a jingle date like the next morning. And I'd literally sleep two hours and get on the train and go back to New York and do the date at eight or nine in the morning, go to my loft in lower Manhattan, take a nap, get back on the train, go back to Philly or DC. And so it was a real mixed bag of, you know, because I knew if I didn't take the jingle date, they'd go down the list and go to the next guy. Needless to say, there are a lot of guys lined up ready to play on those dates, you know, so. And thus, folks, you notice there's a hustle component to all of this. You're going to have to comp uh, hustle and do things that are going to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. So, Jeff, I just want to extrapolate on what you said, which I think was very insightful. And the idea is you have, a, for me anyway, I had a set of transferable skills <laughs> and there was a delta, there was a gap, a set of skills that I needed to acquire. And to your listeners or viewers, that's always going to be the case, right? You're going to know how to do something and you're going to need to know how to do something else. So see if I can share this quickly, but a, a terrific example, I think, of this for me in my life was that um, I went from being a jingle producer to being a web producer. And the way that worked for me was in the jingle biz, there are a set of actors, there is a singer and a guitar player and a copyist and a recording engineer and uh, you know, and a client and a budget and a deliverable, right? 30 second spot for TV. And in the web business, there are a different set of actors or players, but the end result is the same. So that in the web biz, there's like a copywriter and a scripter and a coder and a graphic designer, but there's a client and a budget and deliverable. So I took my jingle producing skills at a meta level and transferred them. But that meant I had to learn about HTML. I read a lot of books. I went to New York Mac user groups meetings in the, in the city, met people, went to some classes, actually took some graphic design classes. Um, I stayed up late surfing the web, looking at the source code to figure out how they put this stuff together. How do they make these website things? And then I got to a point where I felt comfortable enough that I could oversee a team that I hung out a shingle and got some gigs as a web producer. So, I encourage, again, listeners and viewers to keep that in mind. You know, what do you know how to do? What do you want to do? What are the skills you're going to need to have to do what you want to do? Where can you get them? Go get them and then move on and do it again and do it again. And that leads to a question about how people can gain knowledge. You know, here we are as we're, we're recording this early 20, 21st century. So I had to take a, a moment there to, I'm not used to talking in terms of the number of centuries. So <laughs> early in the 21st century, yeah. many of you are going to make it past the middle of this century. And we're for now, and I have to say for now, because the learning has changed a lot and is going to continue to change. Yeah. As of now, where do you see people can start acquiring knowledge and skills that are going to profit them for years to come? Well, so let me just lead by giving you a quote from David Blake, who's the former CEO of a company called Degreed. They have a cloud-based mm -hmm. tool that connects corporate learning management systems with what he calls publicly available learning assets. And they could be blogs or books or newspapers or TED Talks or videos or Wikipedia entries or whatever. But his, his mantra, his sort of manifesto is, the future doesn't care how you became an expert. Like the, and the follow on to that is the good news is there are lots of ways to acquire information today. The bad news is there are lots of ways to acquire information today. So um, you can get data from taking courses, certainly going to college. I'm not dissuading you unless you want to get a Teal fellowship and start your own company. Um, but there are also many adjacent ancillary channels. I mean, I think of things like MOOCs, right? Massively open online courses. Uh, com companies like Coursera, like edX, even Khan Academy, LinkedIn Learning, where I have a course, actually a little plug. Um, there's lots of ways you can get information. Wikipedia, TED Talks are a terrific source of information. Um, so the challenge is rationalizing and doing triage on the sources. So figuring out what, you know, where the conversations are going on that align with your interests and ultimately what your career objectives might be. So and the learner is the learner is in control, right? That's the cool news. 
Yeah, it's a big shift because yeah, for the longest shift. time it was the big bureaucratic university yeah. that decided what was important. Yeah. And no frankly, <laughs> you're the consumer, folks. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, you need. And think about like, you know, I think historically education has been thought of as an event that happened in the past. It's like, no, 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 that no longer is viable. You're going to be learning your whole life. It's a lifelong adventure. It's a never ending, nonstop, you know, journey. So embrace it, enjoy it. It's, it's cool. And there are lots of places to learn. Like you've mentioned a couple, I'll use an example uh, from yesterday with me. I was on the app clubhouse uh -huh. and I stumbled into a conversation that was going on where the head of, I want to say Logitech, was on. I love Logitech. I do too. That's my camera. My mouse. I do. <laughs> my camera too. <laughs> and he's talking about uh, our entering a creator economy. Hmm. I like it. And uh, you know, it it got my attention. Without going into the details of his argument uh, or his contention, it hit with me. And I've been exploring that since, and I see places where it's clearly applicable to what I do, like the podcast, the YouTube channel, all the other things I do that basically allow people to get to know, like, trust, and respect me for my abilities. And folks, you can be doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. In this case, it was Clubhouse that gave me an idea about how to communicate with people. I'll also say that it was on Clubhouse, and I mentioned this to you earlier, my wife has been with her sister now for six months, who's a long haul COVID person. And I was in a club on Clubhouse and listened to a number of doctors who run COVID treatment facilities around the world wow. with some of how they approach treatment. And through that, I was able to go explore and find comparable facilities near my sister-in-law yeah. that my wife has gotten her sister into. Again, you learn things as yeah. long as you get out of the cocoon. Yeah, yeah. And That's, get yourself out and about. Yeah, lots of different opportunities. I also encourage people, especially students, to explore areas out of your comfort zone. I know that's sort of a cliche for sure, but I mean, like when I talk to students that are, say, science oriented, I say, well, why don't you take a course on medieval Irish literature as well while you're at it? You know, or people who are studying economics, it's like, well, why don't you, you know, take a course in ancient Greek philosophy? To, because, again, the rate and pace at which products and services are evolving at innovative companies require a different mindset. They don't require a unique skill necessarily. They require the ability to be a creative problem solver, to be resourceful and resilient, to be comfortable with ambiguity, um, to be aware of your role as a global citizen. You know, we're all kind of in this together at this point, the 21st century global borderless workplace, to be able to work across disciplines. So again, I encourage listeners, you know, to, to expand their horizons. It's studies of the humanities that represent opportunities and the kind of thinking that's gonna make you successful, you know, through the rest of this century. Unless it brings the question to my mind about, Eventually, we have to get to this idea that you know there could be jobs that are going to exist that don't exist right now. Yeah. So, what are the ways that people can find these new jobs as they emerge? Yeah. Um, what's going to allow them to spot them early? Because that was a big part of your journey. It's been spotting trends early and getting on board early. Yeah. So I would say a key aspect of, you know, jobs that don't exist yet is that they're going to be the nebula, if you will. They're going to be created at what I describe as the intersection of traditionally or historically unconnected disciplines, right? So think about that for a sec. Example I cite is nanopharmacy. So the three chemists who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago got it for developing nano machines. So these are machines that operate at like 10 to the minus nine. So just to give you a sense of um, perspective, whether that's a real thing or not, MIT opened a building, a nine story, um, $400 million facility on the MIT campus focused on nanotechnology exclusively. Now the, the um, 
adjacent sort of uh, discipline around pharmacy is that you're now able to build nanobots that deliver pharmacology to uh, tumors or wounds or whatever at the atomic or molecular level even, very specific. So the days of radiation and chemo are hopefully going away sooner than later. There's a cool thing called neural dust that these two doctors at UC Berkeley put together. It's an implantable device the size of a grain of rice, and it generates um, ult ultrasonic sounds to stimulate um, tumors. It also collects information about pharmacology and physiology. So all by way of saying, keep your eyes and ears open for uh, disciplines that are connecting that haven't connected before. And that's where the new jobs are going to be. And there's, there are ways to find these signals. You know, with all lack of modesty, it's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. It's like if you pay attention and look for the right sources, you can see where things are merging and morphing and connecting. Right. I mean, autonomous vehicles, another example, like at some point, we probably in the right settings won't be driving cars anymore. We'll be doing something else in those vehicles. Right. I mean, the idea of like 5000 pounds of steel and glass moving 150 pound carbon based life form around is really inefficient. So people are looking for ways to find a better solution to that problem. Absolutely true. And I, I think in terms of another example in our times, you know, did anyone hear the term messenger RNA until last year? Yeah, okay. totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, technology that connects and it's all, it's all certainly driven by technology, right? So, and new ca careers are going to be driven by, certainly by tech. They're going to require old and new skills, right? And they're going to exist again. That's sort of my three or four around this. They're going to exist at the intersection of disciplines that maybe haven't connected in the past, right? So, and it's exciting. I think it's interesting. Again, I encourage listeners or watchers to, you know, look for where those intersections are taking place. And, I'm curious. Uh, what was you've been featuring is things that involve tech. Is well, is that really where you're seeing the future? Is just intersections where tech and the field are starting to rub up against one another. Yeah, I mean, a tech writ large, right? So a couple of things there. I mean, every company today is a technology company, whether they like it or not. And if they're not, that's a going out of business strategy. I mean, you've got to embrace the leading edge technology or your competitors, you know, your competitors are going to be doing it. So you have to find ways and maybe not all of it is appropriate or can be deployed in a beneficial manner, but you being, you know, C-suite execs running companies, you know, need to be aware that technology is what drive, it drives innovation and ultimately profitability. Um, I think there's this great book called Technological Revolutions in Financial Capital by Carlotta Perez. She's a Venezuelan economist, teaches at Cambridge. Um, but she talks about five cycles of technological innovation, starting with like automated knitting machines in the early 18th century. Um, people trying to figure out what to do with them. People felt like it was putting people out of work, similar to the reactions to AI and robotics in 2021. Eventually, thank goodness, you know, Queen Elizabeth allowed adoption of uh, this, you know, automated knitting machine functionality and the rest is history, right? So these are cycles that have been going on, you know, literally for hundreds of years. So, you know, it's like take as a student or a learner or an early career person, you know, take a deep breath and realize that uh, this is a pattern we've seen. And it many, many to, times, many, many times. And it works out well. It has historically. And as long as you don't panic. Yeah. And I'll use an example from end of last century. There were people who used to be called typists. <laughs> yeah. And they would sit at a typewriter all day, a remarkably inefficient medium, because you had these ribbons and you made mistakes when you typed. Oh. And there was a product that you used to correct the mistakes. Now, white the out. liquid version was called white out, <laughs> oh my goodness. which was horrible, horrible. Oh, and then man. they eventually came up with a paper version that you'd insert into the type. And it was awful. Yeah. And then the first sign of automation showed up in these very limited capability 
uh, word processing devices that cause the generation of typists to freak out. Yeah. And the ones that ad adapted to the new device left the other ones behind, earned yeah. more money, and allowed themselves to realize, okay, I can adapt the change so that when the first PC showed up, yeah, they great, were the ones who were doing word processing. Yeah, great example, like uh, hidden figures, right? Those women that knew how to, um, you know, put together ballistic trajectories by hand using, you know, uh, algebra or whatever, trigonometry, they were ready to understand how IBM computers, how the system 360 or whatever worked. And they, again, transferable skills, they had to learn how to program using Hollerith cards or whatever, but they had skills and they knew what the net result was supposed to be at a meta level, right? Like trajectories for ballistics, like that's what we're looking to do here. So this is a new tool to, to do it. And thus, folks, again, the idea of adapting. Once you spot something, you're probably not the only one who's seeing it, but you can be the one who acts on it. Yeah. Because that's one of the things that people don't do is act on these things and they let others do it. I'll use an example from myself. And this is a non tech example. In the 1970s, a business partner and I had an idea for a lid to a coffee mug. Now, because we were not happy with what was the existing plastic cup top that ex uh, at that time, that frankly, you had to lift off the top to be able to drink the coffee. Right. And we couldn't come up with someone who could design the whole. <laughs> really? That's all it was. That's all yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, that, am that amazing, really. We couldn't find someone who could do that for us, and thus we let it drop. Yeah. And every coffee mug, on the, uh, every coffee cup, every mug has that hole. It's the sliding hole. <laughs> there was the. There was first the tear back hole, right, the and now there's just. The whole. Yeah. And really. it's the idea of acting on the idea that becomes so important. It doesn't mean you have to quit your job tomorrow. Right. But it's about going out and exploring ideas and not yeah. be not being sedentary. Yeah. You know, another point I want to make about sort of new businesses and new new careers, right? Um, is I describe, you know, not everyone is a rock star, right? But in order for Beyonce or Sting to go on stage, there's a whole like coterie of people that need to help make that happen. And the same is the same model or metaphor is true of technology. So for example, I'm very involved in quantum technology these days, right? So I'm the master of ceremonies at a virtual event called Inside Quantum Technology. But the idea is certainly the particle physicists and the electrical engineers get a lot of the press, but people with adjacent skills in other disciplines are going to be needed to drive understanding and ultimately adoption of this new technology. Um, and it's been ever thus. So uh, while the technology at the core may be, you know, qubits, if you will, but someone's got to be in a marketing and comms role to write about it and promote it. Someone's got to be in a journalism role. Someone's got to be an educator. They've got to be teaching about quantum, you know, the profession that enables all other professions. Someone's got to come up with investment strategies behind quantum. Someone's got to um, sell the stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, biz dev, right? Who's going to go out and make a case to clients and get them to open their checkbook and uh, based on an assessment of what the business value of this new technology is going to be. So again, I would encourage listeners, you know, maybe you're not a particle physicist, but you want to be involved in quantum. There's lots of ways to get involved. That's true with any technology um, that's going on today. So keep that in mind. I think it's an important point that doesn't get a lot of play when conversations about technology come up. I think the thing of a site called angel.co is being a website where there are startups doing interesting work and some pretty boring work as well, <laughs> yeah. where you can go exploring, excuse me, see what their current state is, see if you can get involved with the startup. Yeah. You know, even if you're not, not a technical person, there are a lot of jobs that these firms are hiring for.
yes. or they're looking for advisors for that yep. you can make a contribution to them and ride with them. Yeah. And you can even come in, say, as an operations person. And as you learn how the business runs and what the challenges are, you might find yourself with opportunities to move up the value chain or the management chain, right? So let's get Bob in here because he did a great job running the back end system and he might have some ideas about, you know, what the next strategy should be for how we, you know, create R2 of this product or service or whatever. So, well, you know, I encourage people to explore. We're in an interesting time in the world. You know, for a long time, we've been looking at basically a global and borderless workplace. And borders may start to get reinforced again as the U.S. becomes more concerned about China and other nations um, and their capacity to affect the U.S. economy. But overall, we're, leading, we're living at a time where information is free. And the ability to manage information or to use that information uh, in creative ways is important. Uh, if you're talking to, you know, young learners, um, yeah, trying to prepare themselves for this kind of environment, what would you advise them? Well, I gotta I think, say, this is gonna be true for the old guys too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I have something that I call my future career toolkit, um, and it's three sort of steps, if you will, three tools. And it's based on me reflecting on and attempting to codify processes that I've used over the course of these eight careers. So um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the idea is that the tools are voice, antenna, and mesh. The voice tool is, um, it's based on an ideation exercise that a dear friend of mine, Brian Mattimore, who's a brilliant um, ideation guru and does this for big companies and has for 30 years. We put together triggers. Um, think, think of your favorite movie, TV show, book, or game. And what about it resonates with you and use that as a way to focus on what your core interests or passions might be. So for me, for example, my favorite movie recently was um, Blade Runner 2049. I love that movie. I saw it three times. I saw it in IMAX. I saw it in 3D. I saw it in a regular theater. But the, my interest is in sort of future culture and technology, how they're going to intersect. So that's what that's what teases out of that uh, reflection, right, on that movie. So to continue the, the toolkit process, the next tool is antenna. And what that involves is looking for where conversations are going on around the topics you teased out of the voice exercise. So for me, so future career and culture, so there's a website called Futurism that I follow, they publish newsletters. Uh, the MIT Tech Review publishes very specific newsletters around sort of AI and space and crypto and blockchain. Um, there's a TV show called um, BBC Click. It's on every week. And they do really interesting stories about technology and business, sort of bleeding edge technologies and how they're being adopted and how they might be adopted. Um, another great show is um, Bloomberg Technology, which is a daily show, right? 5 p.m. every day. Emily Chang, fantastic moderator. It's, I describe it as a little bit like Entertainment Tonight for Silicon Valley. Like, what are they going to, Tim Costello is leading Twitter. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? How's he going to manage it? But, but it's, the conversations are really interesting. Again, around leading edge technology and investment, certainly VC, where's the money going? Who thinks there's a pony in there? Um, so those are some of the kind of sources, right? And then the third tool is Mesh, which is sort of a 3D data visualization exercise, how to build your mega network. And it's tracking down, and I encourage people to use LinkedIn, although there are other ways to do it. Certainly many academics, for example, don't have LinkedIn profiles, but you can find them on their university websites. But go on LinkedIn, put in Boolean parameters based on the voice findings, and track down people who are leading conversations, future-oriented, innovative thought leaders who are talking about whatever the topic is that you're interested in. So... I, I've tracked people like um, Tom Malone, who's a professor at MIT Sloan. He wrote a great book called The Future of Work many years ago. Um, Gerd Lenhardt is a futurist who lives in Zurich, runs webinars periodically. Christos Four is the GM of um, Quantum at Microsoft. So I connected with her and follow her. 
So that's those are sort of the three tools. That's sort of the processes that I, and I run these workshops at universities called, in fact, how to succeed at jobs that don't exist yet. And I put some preamble about social historical perspective, um, the concepts around intersecting disciplines. And then I end with uh, taking the students through the future career toolkit. And thus that brings me to the question of how can people find out more about you and the work that you do, everything, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, so the first thing I would say is please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always open to LinkedIn requests and I'm happy to have a conversation either using the messaging tool or send me an email or I give you my Calendly instance and you can schedule some time with me. I'm always happy to talk about these topics. It's my passion, you know. Do you know the URL for your LinkedIn profile offhand? Uh, I think it's like whatever, you know, LinkedIn slash Christopher, Christopher Bishop 123, I think is the. So folks, that'd be LinkedIn.com forward slash IN forward slash Christopher Bishop 123. I'll check before it goes into the show I think, notes. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so do that. And then I have a website called improvisingcareers.com and uh, lay out more detail around the toolkit. Um, I keep a travel log in there. Back when I used to do a lot of traveling and speaking in person, um, not so much anymore. It's all virtual like this. But um, so information about my multiple careers as well. There's some fun pictures on the website of me at age 22 in a dressing room with like hair down to here, tuning up my Fender bass, getting ready to go on stage with opening for somebody, doing a gig somewhere. It's so funny, I saw a picture a friend of mine took of Les Paul uh, some years ago in his home with all the guitars strewn around that Gibson had sent to him. Uh, yeah, cool. and, it, and my friend asked, so where do you sleep since his bedroom was overrun with guitars? He said, I, I got a, a couch over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. It's sleeping it, not, not a priority probably at that point in his life. Yeah, it's funny. Very but, true. So, yeah, please connect with me. And I tweet as well. You, at Chris Bishop is my Twitter handle. And I tweet about this, these topics and other topics I'm interested in. The quantum space, leading edge technology, future of work. So Excellent. And if you'll notice one thing, folks, Chris has spoken a lot about things that are going to require you to hustle. It's not going to land in your lap while you're sitting around watching Netflix not Netflix, <laughs> you're going to have to think and notice and act on the things that you notice to go explore and use your native curiosity that Netflix and the others do an excellent job of dulling out. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I would say is it's, I liken it to um, direct mail. So I say again to young learners or even early career millennials or whatever, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. I mean, you got to jiggle doorknobs. You got to, the direct mail model is if you send a hundred postcards, you know, if one person responds, you're doing pretty well. If like three people respond, you're getting a fantastic result. So don't be discouraged. Don't be dissuaded. You know, the right match will appear. You'll find the right setting, the right hiring manager, or whomever, who thinks your skills map to their objectives. Again, it's a quid pro quo, right? So. They're not hiring you because they think you're cute or you're going to, you know, entertain at the Christmas party. Similar to my IBM story, you know, they hired me into IBM because I had a skill they needed that was going to help make them successful. It was going to help some exec with a big P&L, um, you know, make his bogey, get his number kind of thing. So, you know, profit and loss statement requirement. Yeah. Just yeah. making sure that the audience gets yes, the phrase. For sure. I don't mean to be glib with the acronyms. Apologies. But the idea is, you know, keep at it, keep chasing it, and the the right setting will appear. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's what I did to break into the jingle biz, too. I, I, I reached for literally dozens, if not hundreds, of producers, musicians, singers, arrangers, copyists, recording engineers, creative directors, and eventually one producer at an agency, Backer Spielvogel, thought I was, you know, capable of doing what he needed and he hired me to play bass on a miller genuine draft beer commercial and then i was in Whew. i had i had credibility i could tell people yeah i played on a miller commercial last week yeah and it was, it was a snowball from there this is fabulous 
So that's today's show. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, here are a few things I can do to help you with your job search beyond simply being your coach. First of all, I've got a new book out called The Right Answers to Tough Interview Questions. It is like a cookbook with answers to tons of interview questions that you're going to be asked on interviews. And if you pair it up with my other new book, The Ultimate Job Interview Framework, they are a a terrific pair of books to help you with interviewing. In addition to a new service where you can practice mock interviews, if you go to TheBigGameHunter.us forward slash mock, I've got a service there, very inexpensive, like $99, where we have mock interviews set up. I'm going to be adding more to it very soon, but you can record your answers to them And then I can critique them and help you perform better on them. You probably have noticed my show notes are pretty thorough with products and services that can help you with your search. And connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash the big game hunter. Lastly, my website has a ton of great information. That's thebiggamehunter.us. Now, if you're not ready to go there and Go through the blog, put the address in your phone, thebiggamehunter.us, Jeff Altman. So this way, when you're ready to go, you have a way of getting back to my website. Hope you have a terrific day, and most importantly, be great! Be great!